Shana Haba'a Be Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem Over there, over there Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Well, welcome back. This is Theology in Perspective, and I'm Daniel Woodhead, and I am blessed that you could join us again today. We are studying the book of Revelation, that is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that word is singular, revelation, there's no S at the end, because the central character in this book is the Lord Jesus, and it's the revealing of him the way he is now, in the state that he's in now, and we're going to look at that today. That'll be the central message that we look at today as we again open this book, the last book of our Bibles, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the Old Testament told us through the prophet Daniel that prophecy was going to be dimmed down until the time of the end. And others would be um, just not talking about this. And uh, case in point would be the reformers in the 1500s. Uh, they reformed the uh, church, so to speak, if you will, and in doing so, what they did was they omitted prophecy. They just did not pay attention to prophecy. Uh, so that's just one example. Uh, in Daniel 12, verse 4, the text there reads, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And that prophecy is true. There wasn't any study of Bible prophecy until the 1840s or the 1850s. And that's when the rise of the dispensationalists came, and they started looking at the Bible as one whole unit, not a series of 66 books that are unconnected. No, they're very connected, and they started seeing that the time of the end was starting to draw near. Now, people's eyes are being opened now. And they're starting to look at the Bible as a piece of work from God that had a beginning and an end, and it told the whole story. The Apostle Paul called this the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. Now, I want to give you a quote here that I think is quite important, and it's from Sir Isaac Newton. Now, he lived uh, in Britain from 1643 to 1727, and He's primarily known as a, the father of physics or a great physics person. And he wrote that about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. Well, there's even been today a lot of clamor and opposition to those that try and teach and understand the book of Revelation. Most people just won't try. They just look at this and say, oh, I could never understand this. Who could ever understand this? In, uh, in, in many, many instances, I have heard people say that. We, just, it's impossible. You can't understand that. But God gave us this Bible. We can understand it. You know, understanding the book of Revelation is actually easier than most of the other books of the Bible, but it requires a knowledge of the Old Testament. It's, <laughs> there's between six and eight hundred allusions or direct references in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament, and that's the key, knowing the Old Testament. If you know the Old Testament, if you know the Jewish culture, that came out of that Old Testament, then the book of Revelation is easily open to us. Since the beginning of the church, the Gentiles have crowded out the Jews. The Jews started the church. The Jewish presence in the church has gotten extremely small, and the Gentiles are the majority of the church now. And with the Gentiles coming in, especially after Constantine in the early 300s, with this edict of toleration and Theodosius II, who in 388 made it mandatory to be a Christian, he brought all the pagans into the church at that time. 
Now, <laughs> they, 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 what ended up happening was the Jewish holidays just got compromised, and the pagan holidays from all these pagans that came in um, started uh, having more influence. So the church now follows the Roman year instead of the Jewish year, which is really crazy because this is a Jewish Jewish church. Jesus is Jewish. All the writers, all the writers of the Bible are Jewish. Now that's what helps us understand the book of Revelation. All the gospel writers were Jewish. They all worshipped in the temple. They were steeped in rabbinical Judaism and Orthodox Judaism. They understood it. Now there was another individual, Blaise Pascal, and he was another scientist, and he said something quite similar. He said, the prophecies are to be unintelligible to the ungodly, but intelligible to those who are properly constructed. Really, that's the essence of proper instruction. Using the whole Bible, trying to understand it, using common grammar and understanding the Jewish culture. So, the time of the end, the latter days, the last days, all these three terms are the same. And we call this, the issue's been happening here, uh, uh, what we've been looking at is progressive revelation. God has progressively revealed himself to us throughout all human history. He started fellowshipping with Adam and Eve in the garden. And when the fall came, he broke fellowship with them because he can't bear to be near sin. He's perfectly holy. That's something we can't understand, but we will once we've left these bodies and we're glorified. We'll see it. And as a result of that, God has been working his plan to reconnect us to himself. Now, one of the major stages in God drawing closer to man was obviously the appearance of God on the planet in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. We get our salvation through him. But that's still not as direct a contact with God as we will have when the eternal order is reestablished. That will be at the end of the thousand year messianic kingdom. But all throughout human history, we've got appearances by God. We've got God coming closer and closer and closer to us. Depending upon the degree of our repentance, he's closer. When we're sinning, which is obviously to him, he's pulling back, he's withdrawing. He's here, but he's not fellowshipping directly with us, and he's, but he's still being progressively revealed over time. Throughout the scriptures, God is increasingly revealing himself. Adam and Eve walked with God, had close fellowship, and God sent messages by angels. He chose certain men for specific assignments. And he chose the nation Israel to reveal his Shekinah glory and bring the Messiah to redeem the earth through him. So the book of Revelation is now becoming increasingly clearer to us as God allows us to see what has previously been shut up and hidden until the time of the end. Now, we're going to see a much clearer example of this when we look at chapters 2 and 3 in this book of Revel the Revelation, which are the letters to the seven churches in Asia. And we saw that the outline of the book of Revelation is from Revelation 1, verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Those are the three main big divisions in the book. The things that John sees, that's what we're going to look at today. The things which are chapters 2 and 3, it's a discussion of the church age. And finally, those things that are yet future and still yet future to us. You know, we've completed the introduction and the salutation. Uh, we've uh, identified John as the writer. And now we want to see the glorified Jesus that John sees. There's a few short verses on the Revelation that open to John. There's an interpretation that John has been given. We looked at one of those earlier verses in the past 
about the nature of the seven spirits before the throne. We saw that the seven spirits are the seven stars that Jesus held in his hand, and we found that those were the angels, the messengers, in Revelation 3.1. Because he said in Revelation 3, 1, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast the name that thou livest and are dead. So the seven spirits and the seven stars are the same thing, and it gets more clear in the next verse, Revelation 1, verse 20, part A. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the figure of a candlestick comes from the book of Exodus in the tabernacle. We we, we uh, have looked at the tabernacle in the past in other Bible studies, and we saw that the menorah uh, and the seven bold candlestick weighed a talent of gold. A talent, that's, that's over a hundred pounds of solid gold. The thing was huge, just huge. And I'm putting a picture of uh, the menorah up now for you to see that is presently in the uh, Temple Mount uh, group in Jerusalem that are preparing for the next temple. Oil represents the Holy Spirit whenever it's used in the Bible, and we can see how this comes from a study in the tabernacle. Uh, to the seven spirits that are before the throne are angels who go out to be messengers. Now, some think that the angel implies pastor, but the words don't say that. The word is angels or angelos in the Greek. And it's just a messenger angel. That's one of the angel's primary roles. Now remember, there are three levels of celestial beings. Angels are the lowest without wings. And in time and space, they will appear as a, a young man. Then we have the seraphim, which have two wings, sometimes two sets of wings, maybe six wings. And there are cherubim, the highest order of the angelic or the celestial beings. Cherubim guard God's throne. We saw them on the veil of the tabernacle. And the highest order of the highest order was Halal, sometimes called Lucifer. And he was God's right-hand person. He covered the tabernacle. His name's been changed to Satan the adversary after he fell Sin was found in him, and we have this adversary to deal with today. He continues to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. He can impact this world, and he's impacting it today to a much greater degree than he ever has. But Jesus defeated him at the cross. And try and look at this as he's defeated, but he hasn't fully died yet. He's wounded, mortally wounded, and he is dying. Now, moving on to Revelation 1, verse 9. John says, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now John had been banished to the isle of Patmos, which we saw where the Romans would put the, quote, the better class of citizens who had offended them. And, and Domitian, the Roman emperor, was uh, taking people there who uh, were uh, intent upon worshiping gods other than him because he had declared himself deity. Now this is a difficult thing for us to understand, but the Romans who had total control of the population were declaring themselves, the, the leaders were declaring themselves to be gods. <laughs> now moving on to Revelation 1 verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice 
as of a trumpet. Now, he was placed in this spiritual, spiritual, spiritized state of realization or awareness by Jesus to see the future events that are still future to us. That is the Great Tribulation. So the Lord's Day is actually the Day of the Lord. Now, it's not Sunday, as we've established before, but it's the, it's the Day of the Lord. Now, moving on, verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Jesus is the all-eternal one who inhabits eternity. It's from Isaiah 57, 15. And now he's telling John to write what he sees. Jesus shows John. He just doesn't tell him. His vision is going to have an everlasting impact. Now this is the central portion of our message today. Where Jesus, in verse 112, is revealed. Now John says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, Zechariah chapter 4 tells us that the lampstands or the candlesticks represent Israel, and that the oil in the lampstands represent the Holy Spirit, Rauch Hodesh. Remember, remember now, we mentioned this before, the Nation Israel is being judged here, and this is the tribulation. It's also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, where two-thirds of the world's Jews are going to die in this cataclysm until they cry out to Messiah to come, and he will return. And in the midst, Revelation 1, verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Now this demonstrates the centrality of Jesus Christ. It also demonstrates his humanity. From Daniel 7.13, we see the messianic phrase identifying his messiahship. This is not the every, everyday average tunic here. These are the garments of the high priest that are shown to us in Exodus 28.4. Now, John turned around and saw Jesus as he'd never seen him before. He did see a similar Jesus of the Transfiguration when he witnessed some aspects of his glory. But the different figures used in describing the glorified Son of Man are unique. They all come from the Old Testament. And in essence, they describe Jesus in his third office, that of king. Now, I've mentioned to you in the past that Jesus holds, over time, three offices, prophet, priest, and king. The first office was that of a prophet. And he functioned in that office during his first coming, or his first advent. His second office is that of a priest. And he's functioning in that role now as our advocate seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. There were no provisions for that, however, in the temple or the tabernacle. No priest ever sat down in either the tabernacle or the temple. However, the Lord Jesus is sitting with God the Father to make intercession for us. And when he returns, he will function as the king the third office, the king, the Messiah has all three offices, but he doesn't function in them simultaneously. One of the king's roles, you know, is to function as a judge. And a sub-theme of this book of Revelation is judgment. And Jesus is coming to judge the world for its sins. This usage of the lampstand is representative of the seven churches. They are to be a light unto the world. Look what Daniel 7 verse 13 says, where I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like 
the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His hair is now snow white, indicating purity, and, and, he, and he's got eyes that are like flames of fire. They're not flames of fire, but it's like, it's a simile. And like or as indicates uh, something that represents something else. Now this represents judgment, his piercing examination of us shows us that he sees all. He's omniscient. He sees everything, knows everything. There is nothing that he misses in our lives. He sees it all. Don't ever think that Jesus does not know what you're thinking, or you will think. Now Daniel, chapter 10, verse 5, says, Then I lifted up mine eyes, and behold, a, 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 a man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine golds of uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. The voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude, and behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake, and said unto him that stood before me, O oh, my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. And there came again, and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. Now that's from Daniel. He had visions of the future, of Jesus, as Jesus is now in eternity. That's powerful, isn't it? <laughs> Revelation 1, verse 15. And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. The brass feet indicate judgment, and the burning in a furnace, uh, it, it's a comparison just indicating a red, hot, glowing judgment, such as when he uh, spoke the letter to the church of Thyatira. Revelation 2.18 and Revelation 19.15 uses the same comparison. Revelation 19.15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he shall tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, Isaiah 63, 1 says something quite similar. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, I, I speak, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Now, Jesus returns to Basra, which is modern-day Petra, we see that in Micah 2.12, when he first returns, when he first returns. Now we're going to examine the eight stages of Armageddon later in this book. But Isaiah 63.2 and 3 and 4 say, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments, like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Isaiah 63, 5, And I looked, 
and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Now this is Jesus talking in the first person through Isaiah about coming back and judging and fighting the battle of Armageddon. Now Revelation 1.16, we go back to John's vision. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Revelation 1.17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet at dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven church, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, this message is to be understood in Genesis, we have the beginning of all things, and in Revelation, we have the end of all things. Beloved, if you are understanding this for the first time, and you don't know the Lord Jesus, I would beg you to consider his claims. He claimed to be God that came in the flesh. And what we are required to do, if you are called to do this, is to believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. These are historic facts. Jesus, who came here, who came here 2,015 years ago, died on that Roman cross approximately 33 and a half A.D. He died for you. He died to pay the penalty that a righteous God demands for the sins of this world. If you believe that, if you truly believe this historic fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead, you will be with me when we leave these bodies someday. Because everybody dies. No one stays here. You must consider this. Take time and seriously consider that this Jesus who died and rose from the dead wants you to believe that he is God, that he did these things. Now if you've accepted this and you believe that, this as I said, these are historic facts. If you believe these things, then uh, as which is on the screen now, there's some information there for you to get a free pamphlet from us, and we would be happy to provide that to you so that you can start your walk with God, understanding the general outline of the Bible and who Jesus is. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.
take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'ah in Yerushalayim. Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back to Theology in Perspective. I'm Daniel Woodhead and I'm blessed that you could join us again today. We're in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's his unveiling as he is today, not as he was when he left this earth, but as he is today. And what we are seeing here is that this risen Jesus has come to the Apostle John, who's banished to the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea by the Roman Emperor Domitian for teaching the Word of God, and he receives this incredible message about future events of this world. Now, I have to say that only the biblically illiterate fail to see that we are in the last days. And in one of our previous sessions, we saw that that began with the First World War. And uh, we see the uh, Jewish idiomatic phrase, nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, where the Lord Jesus himself used these terms to discuss the last days. Now, his second coming is going to pertain to the entire world. So in Matthew's record of Jesus' words, we're talking about the beginning of the latter days is the First World War. We also saw from the Old Testament that the prophetic word was to be shut up and sealed. Now, the prophet Daniel received this word but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. But it's open now. It's open now, and it's understood now. And this is a book that's meant to be understood, which is why I'm here telling you what this book says. We saw the general outline in verse 1, uh, excuse me, verse 19 of chapter 1, we saw that John saw the risen Christ and who he really is now. I want to give you a very brief outline of the Revelation sequences. Jesus is revealed. Then there are messages to the churches. These are warnings and an exposition of all church history. Then there is the rapture of the invisible church. And these are terms that I'm going to explain as we go through this book. The visible church and the invisible church. Then there is a seven-year tribulation that will begin. Christ returns at the end of this with his saints to complete the battle of Armageddon. And he sets up and he rules the earth for a thousand years. And then the eternal order is established. It's called the New Jerusalem and it comes down from heaven. And that's this book in a very broad outline. I want to talk for a few moments about this concept of the kingdom. And it's, a, it's just a long-awaited time that's at the end of the Great Tribulation where Christ, the King, returns and he sets up his millennial kingdom or his messianic kingdom as others would say. John, the other apostles in the early church fathers, looked forward to it. So do we. They knew exactly what this was. And some theological constructs just refuse to accept the millennial kingdom even though the Lord clearly says this is going to be for a thousand years, and it's in Revelation 20 where that term a thousand years is used six times. Very clear. I mentioned in a previous lesson the quote by two of Jesus' brothers, Jude, grandsons, regarding the testimony they gave to Domitian when they were arrested, and this was recorded by the father of church history, Eusebius of Caesarea. 
and they were taken by Domitian, and he thought that there was some insurrection going on in a kingdom that was going to be established, and he said, no, 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 when the Lord returns, he's going to set up his kingdom. Well, well Domitian then looks at this as inconsequential. Who cares? <laughs> we care. We care. Now, John was placed in this spiritized state. He was fully conscious, fully aware and that what Jesus had done with his consciousness, and he was transported in time to see future events. And those are events are yet future to us. That is the tribulation, or the Lord's Day, which is actually called the Day of the Lord. Today, I want to focus on a concept called the times of the Gentiles, or the time of the Gentiles, if you will. It, it's a sort of a parenthetical exposition here of Scripture. Uh, we're going to be discussing this between chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 1 we saw is the revealing of Jesus to John through the angels. And he's told to write the things that he saw, the things that are, and the things that will be. So chapters 2 and 3 are going to be a discussion of the whole church history in abridged form through the visible church. Now the visible church is simply all the buildings and people in them with various names on the door like Roman and Orthodox and Baptist and Presbyterian and Reformed and so on. That's not the real church. Jesus didn't create any of those types of churches. Jesus said his church is invisible. His sheep know him. His sheep follow him. They hear his voice. The invisible church is the genuine church, and that's made up of all true, genuine believers in Christ from all ages since the church began. And the church had a beginning. A church had a beginning. Just reading the Bible naturally as those words are to be used, you see that the church began on the fourth Jewish holiday of the year in which Jesus died. The first one, Passover, Jesus died. The second one, unleavened bread, he went into the ground. Third one is first fruits, he rose from the dead. And the next holiday is Pentecost. That's when he left and, well, he just left, and then the church was started by the Holy Spirit. So the visible church is made up of all people, whether they believe or not, they're just in all these places called churches. But the real church is the genuine believers whose hearts have been transformed. That's our church. That's the church. Luke 21, 24 says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now this is Luke's account of the Lord's Olivet Discourse. He discusses the circumstances surrounding the Lord's return to the earth. And he states what Jesus said here. He's just repeating it. Jerusalem will be trodden down until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, what's he talking about here? Why is this important to us as believers in Jesus? You know, we seek to draw closer to this Jesus, and we should know what he has for us and beware of the earthly circumstances he's telling us about. In Matthew 24, 25, the Lord Jesus made a very poignant statement. He said, Behold, I have told you before. In this section of the Olivet Discourse, he's warning us to be aware of the deception that's in the earth today. And the Great Tribulation is coming. He warns his children just as we want to warn our children of the evil that's in the world and how to avoid it as much as possible. This is an important part of how we should live for him. We're to obey him 
in all things, including observing the warnings that he gave us. Jesus wants only what's best for us. You know, even if we fully don't understand all of his commands, we trust him. Think of Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. It's constant trusting of the Lord. The times of the Gentiles are just a long period of time from the Babylonian captivity of the Jews until the second coming of Jesus. During this time, the Gentiles are going to have control over the city of Jerusalem. There's been some times when there's been temporary Jewish control over the city. One was the Maccabean period when Judas Maccabeus and his family threw off the yoke of the Greeks in one Antiochus Epiphanes, about 164 BC. <clears throat> the first Jewish revolt against Rome was in AD 66 to AD 70. And uh, the Jews got control over what had been called Palestine or became, it was going to be called Palestine. And, uh, and then the Jews had control again over Jerusalem during the Bar Kokhba rebellion against Rome, and that was AD 132 to 135. That was when Israel became known as Palestine because the Emperor Hadrian was so angry with the Jews after that rebellion that he wanted to rename the land after their mortal enemies, the Philistines, and he mispronounced the name. The Palestines, he called them. So the Palestine is not a good word. You know, in the 1967 Six-Day War, which is temporary, that happened uh, again because Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles for another three and a half years. In other words, that's just another time that the Gentiles have taken, or excuse me, that the Jews have taken control. They will have control again, just like I said. But any Jewish takeover of the city before the second coming is only temporary. It doesn't mean that the times of the Gentiles have ended. The times of the Gentiles can only end when Gentiles are no longer able to trod down Jerusalem. But in order to understand the concept, we, we have to study uh, four Old Testament passages from the book of Daniel, and then we're going to put them together, and each passage elaborates on the previous passage. Now, God revealed these passages to Daniel through visions. Look at Daniel 2, verse 31. But, O king, thou sawest and behold a great image. This image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Daniel, verse 32. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. 33. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. Verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, Daniel provides this general description of the awesomeness of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen. Daniel was in Babylon. He'd been captured by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 B.C., and he was taken to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar has an image of some great big thing, and uh, Daniel is brought to him to describe it. Now, the image is described as having a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and ending with the feet and toes of part iron and part clay. 
Now these metals have some pretty important characteristics here. They increase in strength as they go from gold to iron, and they decrease in value. Keep that in mind. They increase in strength, and they decrease in value. The fulfillment will be the decrease of the character of authority and rule. Babylon was an absolute monarchy with the monarch above the law. The king could do anything he wanted, even if it broke the laws of the land. The Medo-Persian monarch, which succeeded Babylon, was not above the law and didn't have authority even to change his own decrees. The Hellenic kings, <clears throat> which means they came from Greece, they followed Media Persia. They didn't have any dynastic or royal right to rule, and they ruled by force of conquest and personal gifts. Finally, Roman imperialism is the last empire that was a republic that basically degenerated into mob rule merging with the imperial form of government. So those are the four empires, but there will be an increase of the strength of these empires, one over the other. A stone, then, destroys the image, and the stone smites the image on its feet. Then, with the image destroyed, the stone becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. The stone cut without hands emphasizes his divine origin, the Lord Jesus. We know who the rock is. Christ is always described as a rock throughout Scripture. Consider Luke 6.48 or Romans 9.33 or even 1 Corinthians 10.4. Now, after Daniel describes the nature of this image of Nebuchadnezzar, he then goes on to give him an interpretation of it. And I'm going to read that interpretation starting in Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. O king! Thou art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with clay. But in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now, after declaring this interpretation, Daniel begins to interpret the meaning of the head of gold as being Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem in 586 B.C. 
So Babylon was the first empire that began the times of the Gentiles when they dominated Jerusalem. The actual grant given to Nebuchadnezzar included the whole earth, but he chose not to take advantage of this. And Jeremiah affirms that fact in his book in chapter 27, verses 5 to 8. Ezekiel does too in his chapter 26, verses 7 to 14. Now, the two arms of silver united unto the breast of silver represents the two nations of Medes and Persians who established the Medo-Persian Empire and declared it to be inferior to the Babylonians. It just lacked the inner unity of Babylon because the Medes and Persians were united, but they were never really fused into one people group. And further, their government was not above the mistakes of the law. The Greeks, who succeeded them, also known as the Hellenistic Empire, followed the Medio Persian Empire, and it symbolizes by the belly and the two thighs of brass. Because the Third Territory embraced both East and West. The two thighs may also represent Syria and Egypt, which arose out of the Hellenistic Empire and controlled Jewish territory and Jerusalem. Now, its grant was the same as Babylon, but like Babylon, they did not choose to exercise it and take that grant. Now, the rest of the image represents the fourth Gentile Empire, and that one goes through a bunch of different stages. <clears throat> Three of them are presented in this text. First, there's the United Stage. The United Stage gives way to the two division stage, and and that still has the strength of iron, but eventually the fourth Gentile Empire gives way to a ten division stage, and that can be seen in the ten toes here, being composed of part iron and part clay. Now, part of this ten division stage is going to be strong, part's going to be brittle and weak. The lack of cohesiveness is a especially evident in this image within the toes. Unity is impossible, and the ten divisions take place because the different elements just won't coalesce together. The fourth Gentile Empire is unique from all the previous ones. It totally subdues and crushes all that preceded. It's the fourth Gentile Empire that is particularly emphasized by the text dealing with the times of the Gentile. However, the fifth empire that will follow it will not be Gentile, but Jewish. Two prominent symbols are used here, but they're consistent with their use everywhere else in the Bible. You know, whenever the word stone is used symbolically, it's always a symbol of the Lord Jesus, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, of the, Trinity the Messiah of Israel. And wherever the word mountain is used symbolically, it's always a symbol of a king, a kingdom, or a throne. Therefore, following the fourth world Gentile empire, God's going to set up his own kingdom. The kingdom is set up during the ten division stage, and this brings an end to the domination of the other kingdoms. And in the end... The image of Gentile domination is going to be smashed at the second coming once the messianic stone smashes Gentile domination. The kingdom of God is going to be set up. So, let me summarize here. <laughs> the, the first passage dealing with the times of the Gentiles is a period of time when four Gentile empires are going to follow one another in sequence. And the fourth empire is going to go through several different stages. But eventually, this is going to give way to God setting up his own kingdom. And the Gentile empires are of human origin. But the kingdom of the stone is of divine origin. And while the Gentile empires are all temporary, God's kingdom is eternal. So, this then is the sequence. He started with the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Hellenistic Empire, the Fourth Empire that will be described later, 
the united stage of that empire, the ten division stage, and then finally the messianic kingdom. Now, I am going to uh, close for there today, but we're going to continue this discussion of the times of the Gentiles in our next session because we are going to go to the seventh chapter of Daniel where Daniel has a dream, if you will. It's a vision, which is much stronger than a dream, and he receives information about beasts. And these beasts describe in great detail characteristics of these empires. And there's a lot of characteristics of the last beast, if you will. So we're going to look at that uh, when we resume this. It's real important that we understand that the outline of all of human history uh, since the Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. of Jerusalem are important for us to understand this book of Revelation. Remember what I said early on. It's important to understand the Old Testament in order to understand not just the New Testament, but Revelation. That's the key, understanding the Old Testament. This is a Jewish book. It was written by Jewish people. All the apostles were Jewish. All the writers of the Bible have been Jewish. Jesus came unto his people, the Jews. Yes, they rejected him. At least the leaders did. The common people didn't by and large. But the leaders did. Beloved, if you do not know this Jesus of Nazareth, I would beg you to consider his claims. He claimed to be God. He claimed to come into this world for the express purpose of sacrificing himself to appease God's justice. Not vengeance, but justice. Satan, the celestial being, had polluted the heavenly tabernacle and came into the world domain in the Garden of Eden and caused sin to come into the world through our first parents, Adam and Eve. That sin has caused a corruption here that we can't imagine the magnitude of. It's way beyond our understanding because this is all we know. Jesus provides the way out of this craziness by trusting in Jesus, putting your faith in Jesus. The Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through our faith. And it's not something we can do. Otherwise, we'd brag about it. This is nothing we can do other than just believe the historic fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead. And I would ask if you have made that decision today that you call us or write us at the address or the email that is on the screen in front of you now and we will send you a free brochure, no cost, we won't follow up, we won't call, we won't bother you. We want you to have a relationship with the Lord of the universe to guarantee that when you leave this body, as we all will leave our bodies, you will be with Jesus in paradise on the other side. If you've made that decision today, call, write, tell us that you've done this. God bless you. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.
the stair to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Next year, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there. 